Hi, and welcome to the AGI's SDK Components Introduction for Java. In this video, I'll cover several topics. First, I'll introduce you to the basics of AGI technology, what problems our software solves. Next, I'll give a short overview of SDK components, what's required to run them, what components consist of, and some additional resources you may find useful. Then, I'll go into a programming overview for components, where I'll cover how to use units, time standards, coordinate conversions, and other essentials. And finally, I'll discuss programming patterns that are important to know when working with components. Let's get started. AGI provides commercial software for designing, developing, and operating missions within the space and national defense communities. Our software allows you to model complex systems and to evaluate their performance in real or simulated time. To start, we first model time dynamic position and attitude. We can model different central bodies, but most modeling work is done on the Earth. And the first question you may want to answer is, where am I now? And then, where will I be in the future? Or where was I in the past? Next, you'll want to understand your orientation or attitude. How am I oriented? SDK components can model many different types of objects, including sensors, satellites, UAVs, planes, ground vehicles, and ships. Then we take the important step of understanding the relationships among these objects. Using a term we call access, we begin to understand who I can see and who can see me, and whether we can see each other at all. Then we introduce constraints. Constraints limit the ability for one object to see another, such as the limb of the Earth blocking line of sight visibility between the sensor and the UAV. These added constraints determine the quality of the relationship between objects. For example, we may add a terrain constraint, further limiting the visibility of a sensor to other objects. Different lighting or weather conditions may also be present that affect the quality of the relationships too. Another example might be that a jammer is present in my area of interest, keeping me from communicating to my other objects of interest. Components can model your signal-to-noise ratio, in this case, and tell when it falls below critical thresholds. So the sum of an accurate physics-based modeling of objects with the use of constraints on those objects gives us a powerful tool to understand situational awareness in the past, present, or the future. Now I'll move on to the components overview, where I'll show you what's needed to use components for your project. Systems Toolkit, or SDK, is AGI's flagship desktop tool. It provides all of the modeling capabilities I've just described in a desktop environment. This is perfect for engineers and analysts that need to understand how a system will perform, but may not be the perfect choice when systems need to be modeled away from the desktop. SDK Components provides the same functionality as SDK, but in a form that can be used in different environments. They are a set of pre-compiled libraries that are easily referenced from your development environment, and they contain the same multi-domain analysis capabilities that SDK has, including the same industry-validated algorithms. Components provides access to these algorithms in a more granular fashion than SDK does, allowing you to have more fine-grained control over which algorithm to use and which problem domain to focus on. Components is developed in C-sharp for .NET and is also available as .NET libraries. We have our own internal C-sharp to Java converter that we use, and we compile native JAR files for use with Java as well. Our component libraries can be used easily in a scaled environment and support multi-threaded and 64-bit operations. You can also control the amount of multi-threading components does if you like. Components for Java requires Java 6 version 14 or later, and you can always see the latest system requirements by searching for SDK Components Java System Requirements. There are several different libraries that make up SDK Components, and they're generally separated by problem domain. The Dynamic Geometry Library, also known as DGL, is the base library that contains the methods for time, coordinate, coordinates, and reference frames, 
All other libraries require DGL, so you'll always use it in your program. I'm not going to go into each of the library's functions. You can search for SDK components and then read about each one on our product page and then make a decision as to whether or not you need it from there. I do want to point out that all these libraries can work together. For example, if you wanted to understand a navigation accuracy problem, say over a large mountainous terrain region, you can use DGL, navigation accuracy, spatial and terrain libraries together to find your solution. If you search for AGI resources, you'll find our resource page. Here you can download new versions of components or get licenses for them or um, get more training if you need that. There's also a link to our forum where developers or support personnel will answer questions you might have. The help system for components is a great resource. For understanding how components works or learning what's new or figuring out how a method is supposed to work. You can find it by searching for SDK components documentation and then looking for the Java or .NET version. One part of the help that you really must read is the programmer's guide. This section describes how analysis is performed in components and it also has code samples for all of our different solution areas. When you aren't sure about how something in components works, this is where you want to start. Okay, so now we'll move on to the programming overview. In this section, I'll go over things you need to know when you start programming with components. And first we'll start with units. Components uses the SI system of units. Typical units are listed on the right uh, there where time is in seconds, lengths are in meters, and so on. Note that there are no units listed in the documentation at all unless they are different from SI. So if you don't see units somewhere, assume it's an SI unit. Uh, also, there are types and components that don't require a specific unit type. Uh, whatever unit you use to initialize the object with will be the unit that comes out as part of your result. And we'll see some of that in just a minute. So now we can move on to our first code sample. I'll show code samples where it makes sense to show them and show the different ideas and how they're put into practice. Uh, I'm going to use Eclipse, and for many of the code samples, I'll be able to run the code and actually show you some results. Uh, in our first example, I'll show you how to convert angles to and from radians and then show how some types can use variable units as well. So here we are in Eclipse looking at the first code sample on units. Each of the samples will have a small main method at the top that will run the code, uh, but we'll spend most of our time in the methods where all the action is happening. In the first method, two radians, I'm just going to define a variable called angle in degrees with some value. And then I'll use the uh, class trig that's part of components to do some conversions for us. So using the methods degrees to radians on uh, the trig class, I'll convert the angle in degrees to radians and then go ahead and print that out. And then I have another class called degrees minutes seconds that I'll use just to show you that you can enter uh, angles in different ways. Uh, I'll create an angle um, with degrees minutes seconds and note that there's a one there in the first argument and Looking at the Java doc, I'm kind of curious as to what that is, and it looks like it's the number of revolutions, so essentially adding 2 pi to this angle. So I'll get an angle in degrees, minutes, seconds, and then use the same trig class and convert degrees, minutes, seconds to radians, and then print that out as well. In the from radians class, I'll just specify a random uh, angle in radians, and then use the radians to degrees method again to convert uh, that angle in radians over to degrees and print that out. And finally, I'll use radians to degrees minutes seconds to do the reverse operation for that angle as well, and then print all of the uh, information out for that angle. At the bottom is a method where uh, I just wanted to show you how to enter units that you specify, and they don't have to be SI units, they can be anything you choose. So let's say you had coordinates x, y, and z in astronomical units and you wanted to create a Cartesian position. You can do that easily here and the value you'll get back out of the Cartesian, the value that your position will have in units is astronomical units. So it's very easy just to use whatever units you want for many of these different types. And this is just an example of how you might do that. So at this point, let's go ahead and run the code and look at the answers from the to and from radians methods. So I run the code, and this is the output from the to radians section here. 
uh, 20 degrees is 0.349 radians. And then one ray of 30 degrees, 24 minutes, 55 seconds is 6.8 radians, apparently. Uh, in the from radians case, I've got 1.358 radians is 77.79 degrees. And that same value is um, expressed in degrees, minutes, seconds down at the bottom there. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation and move on to the next slide. And we'll talk about time. Time really is critical to components calculations and is modeled accurately by the Julian date type. Uh, the Julian calendar, if you're not aware, starts at the year 4713 BC and uses the usual day and second divisions. Julian dates have been used by astronomers for a very long time under the, and they're basically the standard when dealing with astronomical calculations. To get the best accuracy possible, we store the days uh, part of Julian date as an integer and the seconds portion of the day uh, as a double in the Julian date type. There's also a duration type that represents the difference between the two times. Uh, we'll see that in a minute here too. And we also provide support to and from Jota time. Uh, one thing to mention is that Julian dates are not the only time type in components. Uh, take a look at the documentation for other types that you can use. In the code sample, I'll show you the Julian date and duration types and then how to convert to and from Jota. Okay, so let's look now at the time example. Uh, in the first method, AGI types, I'm creating a Julian date type and giving it a integer day number. And remember, this is from the year minus 4713. Uh, if I want to take that date and convert it to a different time standard, uh, I can do that by calling the two time standard method on Julian date. So here we're going to get a Julian date that is in the time standard barycentric dynamical time. And I'll print those results out, and we can look at the day and the seconds of day for that. Uh, next, I'll get a duration uh, between this date and uh, the date 50,110. And we'll look at that duration and print the days and seconds of that out. And then to go from Jota types, I can create uh, a new Julian date with the Jota type date time and just get the current time now. And I'll get the day and seconds of day for that. I can also use a Jota type period uh, of one hour 30 minutes and I can create a brand new duration or a new components type duration out of that period as well. Um, a thing to look at here is that I can now take that Julian date and I can add the duration to it. So I've got a particular date, I can add any duration that I like to it as well. And then we'll look at the output of that Julian date in days and seconds. And then uh, to go to Jota date types, um, I can create a Julian date and call the to date time method and then print out that particular date time and also the duration. I can create a period from a duration as well. So we'll create another duration and then we'll look at the output of that period. Let's go ahead and run that. So in the first section, On the AGI types, the day was 2455424, seconds to lapse 0. Uh, you can see the actual Julian date days, it gets printed out, and the total number of seconds. Uh, note that we are getting uh, total days and total seconds out. That's what those are. In the from Jota types, I have the initial day and the seconds elapsed um, for that particular day. And I've got a one hour, 30 minute period, and I convert that to a duration. And I see that here as well, 31333. And finally, in the two Jota types method, I get the date time that I created from that Julian date, and I'll put that, that's the date time um, that I had put in here initially. And the duration that I printed out, I wanted to get that as a period and print those variables out as well. So I've got days, hours, minutes, and seconds out for that period. And so you can see it's relatively easy to go back and forth between Jota types and to use the uh, Julian date type in components as well. There are several time standards in components. Any time representation can be converted from one time standard to another pretty easily. Refer to the documentation for descriptions of these standards if you need to use them. 
Uh, the time standard code samples will show how to convert different standards and how time standards work with durations. Uh, durations where the time standard is not specified and then a du duration where the time standard is specified. So we'll switch over to code and we'll look at the time standard sample. And first up here in the main method um, we'll take a Julian date and with this particular constructor where we have a day of year and seconds of day notice that we're going to get a date that has a time standard of international atomic time. So uh, we'll have a date in TAI here, and I want to take that date in TAI and turn it into a GPS time. To do that, I just need to call the two time standard method and get the global positioning system time standard from the time standard class as an argument to that. And then I have a date in GPS. Uh, to get a date in UTC, I'll do something really similar. I'll uh, get coordinated universal time and supply that to my uh, two time standard method and get a date in UTC as well. So that's uh, all there is to it to convert a date from one time standard to another. Not that hard really. Uh, in the next two methods I want to look first at the duration that does not have a time standard specified and then we'll look down a duration with a time standard specified and see what the outputs are just so you understand how durations and time standards work together. So in the first one here on line 18 I'll create a new duration uh, I'll call it five days and I won't specify a time standard for it and then I'll create a new Julian date we'll just call now and I will give that one a time standard of GPS time so when I want to create a new Julian date called five days from now I want to add uh, that duration five days to my current time and then print out for the five days from now what that actual standard is We'll have to look and see what that is. And then uh, in the next method, duration with a time standard, I'm going to do the exact same thing, except this time my five days duration is going to have a TDB, uh, barycentric dynamical time, time standard. I'll print out what that time standard is so you can see that, and then I'll add that to my Julian date, which still has a GPS time. So I'm essentially adding a duration in TDB to a Julian date that's in um, GPS time and then I'll print out what the actual time standard is in the resultant five days from now variable so we can see what that is and you'll know how components works with time standards and durations. So I've run the code. Uh, the first printout here is system print line for the standard on five days from now in the duration without a time standard specified and it is global positioning time kind of as you would expect. The duration doesn't really have a time standard so it follows the Julian dates time standard. Uh, in the next output line, I'm printing out the time standard for the duration, and it, it is barycentric dynamical time. But when I add it to my Julian date five days from now, notice that the output is again in GPS system time. So uh, what we've done is we've taken that duration and converted it to the time standard of the time, uh, the Julian date that you want to use before uh, adding it to that Julian date. We've converted it to GPS time. So now you kind of understand how durations work with and without time standards. Uh, in case uh, you need to use these, uh, this is very helpful information to know. Switching back now, uh, we'll move on to translational coordinates. So translational coordinates in components represent the position of one set of axes to another. Uh, typical uh, classes two-dimensionally are two-dimensional Euclidean space types that we have are rectangular uh, that take an x and y and a unit rectangular that take an x and y. A polar type which takes a clock and a radial and then we have three-dimensional Euclidean space types as well. A Cartesian, unit Cartesian, cylindrical, spherical, and unit spherical. The unit types there will always ensure that the magnitude of the vector form from one of these coordinates is equal to one. Next are rotational coordinates. So rotational record coordinates represent the orientation of one set of axes to another set. And we have quite a few different types of rotational coordinates here. An angle axis, an align constrained, an elementary uh, rotation, an Euler sequence, a yaw pitch roll sequence, uh, two types of matrix uh, rotations, and quaternion and unit quaternion types as well. 
for the code samples, uh, for translational, what I want to do is I want to show you how to convert between two compatible translational coordinate types. Uh, I want to retrieve the normalized representations of those so you know how to do that if you need them. And then we'll convert using uh, ellipsoid types as well. And I'll show you some basic vector operations so you'll know how to do um, those as well. For rotational, I'll show you how to convert between different compatible rotational coordinate types as well. So we'll head back into code and we'll move over to the coordinates sample. So in here I've got a convert translational method, a normalized translational method, an ellipsoid types translational, some vector operations, and then rotational at the bottom. And we're going to go through each one of these. So we'll start with a convert translational. Um, for the spherical type, there were a clock angle, a cone angle, and a magnitude that I have to specify. And again, hit the documentation if you're not sure what these different types mean, but I'll show you how to at least assign them and use them here. Uh, for the clock angle, I'm going to use pi over 4. The cone angle will be pi over 8. And the magnitude is 100. And I can create a new spherical type, and uh, that'll be set there, and I'll print out what those are. And to create a Cartesian type from that spherical type, all you really have to do is supply that spherical to the Cartesian's constructor. We'll do the conversions uh, within the Cartesian type itself and convert those to the right Cartesian type for you. So if you only know if you don't know the Cartesian and you only have spherical coordinates, you can convert them easily by uh, just supplying the right type to the constructor there. Okay, now I'll move down into the normalized translational. Again, I'll create a spherical type with the clock, cone, and magnitude. I'll create a unit spherical type just by calling the normalized method on spherical. And we'll output that normalized spherical so we can see what the uh, types, what the change type is there. Uh, we'll create a rectangular type. And we'll specify the x and the y there, and then a re normalized rectangular doing the same method is calling normalize on rectangular and outputting the normalized rectangular. And then I'll create a Cartesian type with the x, y, and z Cartesian there. And then I want to use something uh, called an out variable. And I'm going to talk about out variables a little bit later in the course. Uh, for now, uh, we're basically going to get a variable out of this normalized method for Cartesian that is the magnitude. Um, and I'll tell you more about how that works a little bit later. Uh, but we'll print out what the normalized Cartesian is there, so we can see that. And then down under ellipsoid types, translational. Uh, ellipsoid types really refer to types that are native to the Earth or a central body. So in our case here, we've got longitude, latitude, and height. Um, we're going to use the trig method to get my degrees for longitude and latitude. And then I'll create a type called cartographic. And the cartographic is the type you specify with longitude, latitude, and height. Notice that the longitude is specified first in the cartographic constructor. Uh, that's a common mistake for new users. Then we get uh, an Earth central body. And this is where we're going to um, talk a little bit about facets and context and stuff and how you actually get an Earth central body out. I have a chart on context a little bit later as well, but for now we're just going to use it. And I finally get the shape of the Earth from uh, the Earth central body type, and that is an ellipsoid type. And by doing that, it allows me to get the exact cartographic to Cartesian transformation. And so I can take that shape and call the method cartographic to Cartesian, giving it the Cartesian coordinates I've got, and I will get the uh, Earth-centered fixed uh, X, Y, and Z values for that latitude, longitude, and height out with just these couple of lines of code. Uh, familiar, if you're familiar with some of these algorithms, these are fairly long to do, but in components, it's only a line or two of code to get that out. Uh, finally, moving on to vector operations, uh, we'll create a couple of Cartesians, and those are essentially vectors, or x, y, z coordinates. So we'll create a couple of those, and then we'll create a matrix 3 by 3 uh, using the uh, values there you see there in the constructor. And I can create a Cartesian inverse by just calling the invert method. I can add uh, vector 1 to vector 2 using the add method. I can subtract vector 1 from vector 2 using the subtract method. And then the cross product is very similar. I have a cross method. So vector 1 cross vector 2. And I finally have a dot product as well that I'll use by the dot method. 
uh, if I want to do a little bit of matrix math there, I'll get a vector result out by using the uh, static multiply method on Cartesian. And I'll multiply two times the matrix multiplication of matrix times vector one. So we'll see that uh, matrix math there, the result of that, and we'll print that out. And finally, uh, we'll convert rotational. So I'll create an angle and I will get a unit Cartesian, which is going to represent my axes. So by giving a one in each one of those, I have an X, Y, and Z axes, Cartesian axis. And I will create an angle axis rotation type by giving it that initial angle of pi over three and the axis that I want to rotate about. I can convert between these different rotational types just like I was doing with the translational types by supplying my angle axis as a uh, constructor parameter to unit quaternion, uh, my matrix three by three, my Euler sequence, and then specifying uh, how I want to, that Euler sequence to happen, in this case using a 3 two, one transformation. And then I can also create a yaw pitch roll uh, doing the same thing, supplying my angle axis in the constructor and doing the yaw pitch roll indicator of uh, first about yaw, then pitch, and then roll. So converting different uh, rotational types is just as easy as converting translational types. So let's go ahead and run this. And I see a bit of data here. So let's see where the first output statement is. And I've got the spherical type. So you can see the output is spherical uh, for uh, the spherical output. And then I've got a Cartesian output of that spherical. So a converted as I said before, converted in the constructor to get the actual Cartesian components for that spherical vector that I had. In the normalized translation, the first output there is the normalized spherical. And notice there's only two values in that normalized spherical. Uh, that's because the magnitude is always one. And so this gave me uh, the same values that I had put in there, which I guess isn't too surprising. Uh, the next output is the normalized rectangular. So my rectangular was a 1.2 and a minus 2.3. And my output now is 0.46 and minus 0.88. So these were divided by the magnitude of that vector. And those are my normalized outputs. And let's see, the last output is my normalized Cartesian. Um, that is this guy here, these three coordinates, uh, normalized by the magnitude. And we could have printed out the magnitude as well to find out what it was that it divided by. Um, but in this case, all I really needed was the uh, the unit Cartesian values that come out of there. And uh, let's see, the last output is here in the vector operation translation. So I did the matrix math where I multiplied two times the matrix uh, multiplied by vector one, and I got this vector result out. Um, I'll let, uh, let that be an exercise for the watcher to find out if that math is right, but I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, I think that's all we have for outputs in here. Moving on to the next section. To model your system, you'll need to understand how to model motion in components. Most objects will move, and their position and orientation may change the access to other objects. Motion is the collection of position, velocity, and higher derivatives, and they're contained in two generic motion types, motion one and motion two. Motion one of type T holds the coordinate position value as well as the derivatives of that value uh, all values in motion one uh, are of type T. In motion two, the coordinate value itself is of type T, but all higher derivatives are of type T derivative. To access the position value in a motion object, use the get method with the order zero. Velocity can be obtained by using order one, acceleration order two, etc. Be sure to use the get order method to determine the maximum order this motion represents. If you use an order outside the defined range, you're going to get an exception. To uh, show you how motions work uh, in the code samples, I'll show you how to obtain a coordinate value, uh, access the first and second derivatives, as well as higher order derivatives, and then using the get order method to determine the highest level that you can get. So switching back to code, and looking at the motion example, uh, starting at the top, uh, the main method is empty. It's really just uh, going to be showing you how to do this in this particular example. 
but I've got a function on line 13 called sum function that just creates a new motion one of Cartesian type. So the value and all of its higher derivatives will have a Cartesian type. Um, in the second method, some other function, I've got a motion two, which the position value will be a unit quaternion, but all higher derivatives are going to be of type Cartesian. And so that's just going to return a default motion two here. Uh, so I can create a motion one Cartesian translational motion by calling some function, and I can have rotational motion uh, represented by motion two. If I want to get just the coordinate value out, I can get my translational motion and I can call the get value method. That'll return a Cartesian as I would expect um, and I can just uh, reference my position there from that. To get my rotational motion out, my rotational value out, I, again I'll call the get value method. Uh, this time the uh, output will be a unit quaternion as specified by that uh, motion two. To get higher level derivatives, uh, I'll create my translational motion function. I can use the method get first derivative, which I will call the velocity. Uh, remember all of motion ones are Cartesian, so it's going to be a Cartesian as well. I can call second derivative, that'll be a Cartesian, I can call that my acceleration. Uh, in the case of rotational motion, I'll get that out. And the first, cart uh, first derivative I'll get back out is going to be a Cartesian, uh, not a unit quaternion. It says all higher derivatives are going to be a Cartesian type, and so my rotational velocity will be a Cartesian, my rotational acceleration will be a Cartesian, and so on. To get higher level derivatives, I can just start using the get method. Uh, so if I want to get the third derivative, I can just use get with the index 3, and then I would get uh, the jerk out for uh, my motion 1, and I could have a rotational jerk as well uh, by using the get method with an index 3 for the rotational motion. Uh, before you uh, call these methods, though, you really should be calling the get order method to make sure that your particular motion is going to support a higher level derivative. So call the get order method. You can get the highest translation order out of that method. And then you can get the highest derivative you need to by just supplying that highest translation order to the get method here. So that way you're guaranteed not to get an exception uh, because the existing derivative or the derivative will actually exist. So that's what you'll want to do there. And you can do the exact same thing for rotational motion and with motion too. You can bring any data you may already have into components by creating the correct types and initializing them with your data. For example, you may have time order, position, and velocity data. You could then create a date motion collection instance to hold your data and then use the appropriate propagator or interpolator for the data when you need it. Components also provides classes to read and write standard SDK file types, making interoperability between engineering analysis using SDK and operations using components easy. In the code sample, I'll show how to read in an SDK ephemeris file and use it to get time, positions, and velocities. So now we'll look at some code to read an SDK ephemeris. And first, I'll create a buffered reader to read in the ephemeris file. Most ephemeris files end with the extension E, so we call them .e files for SDK. Uh, I'll create the type uh, of ephemeris file called SDK ephemeris file, and there's a method called read from on SDK ephemeris file that I can supply that buffered reader to that'll read the data in for me. Uh, then I'll create a, a variable called data that's called just the base type of ephemeris. I don't know what the format of this ephemeris is yet, so I'm just going to get this data as a base type. And then in the next line, I'm going to convert it to the type of data that I know it is. Uh, SDK.e files can uh, contain a lot of different data. We can have times and positions with no velocities. Maybe it has velocities. Maybe it has accelerations. Sometimes there's additional data like covariance associated with it as well. Uh, in our case, uh, we know it has time, position, and velocity data, so we're going to cast that base ephemeris type to the ephemeris time pause vel type so we can get our position and velocity data out. Uh, once we do that, um, if it's not null, if that cast actually succeeds, then I can go ahead and get my ephemeris data. I can get the dates out. I can get the values, which are the positions, and then I can get the first derivatives, which are the velocities. So a 
uh, what this creates for me is a, a date motion collection which gets me the dates and the positions and the first derivatives out and uh, that's about it for this sample so now we'll move on to calculation contexts a calculation context is a programming construct unique to components and they're similar to global variables they allow common data to be accessed from anywhere in the program without having to pass that data around. Contexts, though, are more useful than global variables in that they allow the data to be changed for individual threads if needed. One example is that if one thread may need to model the Earth fixed to inertial transformation one way, while another thread may need to perform that translation differently, you can supply different data to each of those threads via the calculation context. Uh, contexts are not usually dealt with directly. Rather, uh, you would use a facet to get the current context, and Components currently supports two facets, the central bodies facet and the leap seconds facet. Every spawn thread has its own copy of the calculation context, if it's specified by the get instance method. If you create threads in your own project and you want them to have a calculation context, you'll need to specify it using the get instance method. When Components creates calculation threads internally, though, it copies the current calculation context to each thread, so you, you won't need to do that. In the calculation context code sample, I'll show you how to get a copy of the Earth, how to change it, and how to use those changes in future contexts. I'll also show you how to use the current context in a new thread. So looking at the code now, uh, the line here, line 13, is one you'll use quite often. This is how you get a copy of the Earth. Uh, Earth is defined by the type Earth Central Body, and that comes from the Central Body's facet get from context method. There's a get Earth method on get from context, so Earth is a part of the current context that you're passing around. Uh, there are other get methods. Uh, I think you can get the moon and get the sun, for example, from that context. If you need to change the properties of the Earth or the central body you're working on, you can get a copy of the central body's facet itself and then uh, configure the instance of Earth or whatever it is you're working on and then call the use in current context method on that central bodies. And that'll copy the properties of Earth back up into that uh, current calculation context. If you made changes and you want that to be the new default, you can use the method set default for new contexts here and give it the calculation context .get instance method. This assumes you've already uh, performed the central bodies using current context method up here. So when you set this uh, set default for new contexts, uh, it'll take all of your changes and make those a default for any calculation context that's used in new code. If you are creating a thread, uh, you can get the calculation context by using the copy for another thread class and taking the current instance of your calculation context and copying that into a variable here and then passing that into uh, your calculation context when you create the thread itself. So you'll get the current context uh, that you're working with and set that as the new context inside the thread that you create. Again, as I mentioned previously, uh, Components, when it creates threads internally, does this automatically already. So you won't need to do this for anything under the hood that Components does. But if you create new threads that you want to have a calculation context for, uh, you're going to have to pass the context to it if you want to use it. For the last topic in the section, I'll cover out parameters. Out parameters allow for additional return values of a method to be located in the argument list of that method. Out parameters are a .NET construct, and since Component supports both .NET and Java, we have a way to use an out parameter in Java as well. The effect of an out parameter is achieved in Java by using a single element array, and in the code sample, I'll show you how to create the single element array that will serve as the out parameter and then retrieve the result. So in this out parameter sample, I'm going to create a Julian date, and I'm going to try and convert that from international atomic time to coordinated universal time using this method called try convert time standard. So these try methods, if you're not familiar with them, return a Boolean result that is true if the conversion succeeded and false otherwise. Uh, but the, this isn't the result we need. We actually want the time value. So the time value itself is going to be contained in this out parameter 
uh, returned in the argument list. So here on line 18, I create the out date, which is a new Julian date parameter. Um, only I only need one of those, so it's um, only going to be one element in that array. And then I send that out date into the argument list as uh, the second argument in the try convert time standard method. If the result is true, and in this case it will be, then the value return in outdate, the zeroth element, will be the converted time standard. And so that's just a quick sample of how out parameters work in Java. Now that we've covered the essentials of programming with components, let's look at the common patterns that you'll encounter and need to know how to use to work with components effectively. For our first pattern, I want to cover reference frames and transformations. SDK Components contains a full-featured geometry engine for modeling vectors, axes, points, and reference frames, and how each varies over time. For example, a point might represent the position of a satellite as computed by a propagator. A set of axes might represent the Earth-fixed axes. If you're familiar with SDK Desktop, SDK Components Geometry Engine is modeled after SDK Desktop's Vector Geometry Tool, or VGT. SDK Components Geometry Transformer allows you to easily transform between geometry components by following the chain of relationships between them. In the code sample, I'll show you how to create a transformation between earth inertial and earth fixed frames, and also how to transform an earth fixed point type to earth inertial for any time. For our first example, create fixed ECI transformation I'm going to get a copy of the Earth, uh, as we've seen before, and I want to show you two more steps here that I didn't show before, and that's on line 28 and line 29. Uh, to accurately model the ECI to fixed transformation, you need to have up-to-date Earth orientation parameters data. And you can get that from a file here, it's called eop-v1.1.txt. That file is located and updated daily on the AGI FTP site. Uh, you can use this file and get a path for that file and then supply that as a parameter to the read data method in the earth orientation parameters file class. That will read all the data in the EOP file and populate the earth with that data. So I'm using the set orientation parameters method to make sure that my copy of earth and my current calculation context has the right earth orientation parameter data for this transformation. Um, I'm going to create a Julian date called now that we're going to use to evaluate our transformation at. And then I'm going to create something called an evaluator. Uh, reference frame evaluator is a type that I use to create um, something that I want to get data out of at a specific time. And I haven't talked about evaluators yet. That's coming up in the next section. Uh, but you'll see more information on that there. So I'm going to create something with my geometry transformer. Uh, a method called get reference frame transformation and I can supply any reference frame here I want to get the transformation in our case I want to convert from the fixed frame to the inertial frame so I'm going to supply those two frames and create that evaluator based on those two frames and then when I evaluate the evaluator at that particular time now that I said above it gives me a transformation uh, that's of con type kinetic transformation that I can then use to convert a vector to inertial so the next line, I create a Cartesian vector, fixed vector to transform, and then I want to transform that into an inertial vector, and that's done simply by calling the transform method on that transformation I created and supply that fixed vector. It then returns to me that equivalent inertial vector. Next, I want to show you how to convert a point and transform a point a different way, still using the geometry transformer, but using a different method on it. Uh, again, I'll get a copy of the Earth here, and then I want to create something called a point fixed offset, which is uh, simply a point that's offset from some frame. I'm going to offset my point by a Cartesian from the Earth fixed frame, and then I'm going to create something called a point evaluator from the geometry transformer. And this observe point method is really important because it allows you to observe points that you've created in one frame in a different frame. So I've created this point in the Earth's fixed frame here, but I want to observe the point in the Earth's inertial frame. And so I've got an evaluator that will evaluate the position of my point 
in the Earth's inertial frame, even though it was defined in a different frame. Um, you may uh, realize here that this point fixed offset in the Earth's fixed frame is not going to change its position as a function of time. It's always going to be at that one position that we've defined. But in the inertial frame, that point does move as a function of time. And so as I evaluate that uh, point evaluator here, as I evaluate that down here over uh, a specific time interval, or in this case, just a single time, the position and velocity of that point in inertial space will come out as a motion one of Cartesian. And so we'll see how that point moves in inertial space. The evaluator pattern is the most common pattern in components. The evaluators allow you to get the results of your analysis over time. One of the nice things about components is that the time-dependent nature of all objects is contained within the objects themselves. You won't need to think about how an object moves over time. An evaluator for your object will let you determine how your analysis progresses over time. The pattern follows this flow. First, create the definitional object. A definitional object is a specific type in components, and most items you can configure in components are derived from the definitional object type. After you create your definitional object, configure it to model your analysis situation. Uh, this might involve defining its location, its orientation, or other extensions that model your specific behavior. And then once defined, obtain an evaluator for your definitional object, and then call the evaluate method on your object's evaluator and specify a time or times to evaluate at. The results of the evaluation will be returned either as motion or coordinate types or something similar uh, that be consistent with your object's definition. In this code sample, I'll show you how to create a definitional object and get an evaluator for it. I'll also show you how to update the evaluator if you need to change the definition of your object. In this code sample, the definitional object I've chosen to evaluate is the axes linear rate. Axes linear rate is a set of axes that will just rotate about a defined axis. And so first we're going to define this definitional object and then we'll create an evaluator for it and then evaluate it. And I'll show a couple of different examples of this as we go through this. So I'll create the axes linear rate. I'll set the reference axes to the Earth's J2000 frame. You can see that in the first line here. And then the reference epoch for this rotation to uh, the time epoch J2000. I want to set the initial rotation of this axis, so the initial rotation position, to um, just a standard identity for a unit quaternion. And I want to set the initial rotational velocity for this axis to 0 0.1 radians. I'm not going to set any acceleration in this time, so this axis will just rotate about the spin axis, which I set next, uh, at a velocity of 0.1 radians per second. So the spin axis is set by providing a, a new unit Cartesian, and the spin axis will be the x-axis, because I have a 1 set there. Then, my definitional object at this point is set up. The next thing I want to do is create the evaluator for this set of axes. And so I just call the get evaluator method on my definitional object, and that gets me, in this case, an axes evaluator. The next thing I want to think about is what time I want to evaluate these, uh, this axes over. In this case, I want to evaluate it just at a single time, this new Julian date that I've created here. And then I call the evaluate method with that particular date to get the rotation out at that, that particular time that I've just set there. So, the result of this particular evaluate method is a unit quaternion, uh, and that will be my rotation at the particular time that I've set there. In the next example, I'll create the same thing, an axis linear rate, but I'll construct it just a little bit differently just to show you the variety and the different ways you can construct things in components. So I'll create an axis linear rate. Uh, this time, though, I'm going to get a copy of Earth and I'm going to set a location, a cartographic type, a new location to uh, be this longitude, latitude, and altitude. Uh, so I'll use that location here in just a moment. So then I want to set my reference axes to a new set of axes called axes east, north, up. Um, this is an axis type that's usually used uh, on the surface of the Earth. It requires a central body and a new point cartographic type and I'll use my location that I just defined above. Uh, so that reference axis now will be sitting at the Earth 
at this particular location. I'll set the reference epic to the start time I created up at the very top up here, the current time. I do want to set an initial rotation, and so I'll set that using this method here where I wanted to find just an elementary rotation about um, my z-axis. So I'm taking axis indicator third, which is a z-axis, and I'm rotating my axis by 45 degrees. So I, the easiest way to create that is with an elementary rotation, but my initial or set initial rotation method takes a unit quaternion. So using the power of the constructors and components, I can just take that elementary rotation, supply that to a unit quaternion as the um, argument to my constructor for unit quaternion, and I can set my initial rotation that way. I will set my rotational velocity uh, to five degrees per second. Uh, and of course the trig degrees to radians converts that into radians seconds, radians uh, per second for us. And I'll leave my acceleration at zero for now. I will set my spin axis in this case to be that z-axis. And so I've got an initial rotation of 45 degrees on that z-axis and I'm going to continue spinning around that z-axis. So that definitional object is set up. Um, I'm going to follow the same process I did above where I get the evaluator for my axes and then I want to evaluate it, but this time, instead of evaluating it at a single time, I want to evaluate it over a time interval. So I've set a start and stop time uh, above, and I'll supply the start and stop time, and I want to evaluate it at a certain step. So I'm going to use a duration of one second. I want to know what the rotation is from start to stop every second. That's what the first three parameters here uh, talk about. So when I, get, when I use this evaluate method, um, I'm not getting a unit quaternion like I had before where I evaluated it at a single time. I'm getting a date motion collection two out, which is a unit quaternion for the initial value and a Cartesian for all the higher derivatives. So once I evaluate it, I've got that. I want to look at the actual um, output of that. What I can do is take the values that I get from that um, evaluator and I can create an angle axis rotation type and then I can go ahead and print out what those uh, angles are as a function of time. And so I'll do that and we'll go ahead and I'll show you the results of that here. Let's go ahead and run this. So I can see at this particular time, 1847.23, 1847.24, I started off at 45 degrees, and the spin axis, I had the get axis over here is 0, 0, 001, so that's about the z axis. And you can see every second it's increasing by uh, 5 degrees, which is what I had specified above. I wanted to see a 5 degree per second uh, velocity. And so that's just another way to show how to set up an evaluator. If you have created an evaluator, for a definitional object and then decide that you want to change that definitional object, um, you're going to have to create a new evaluator. And so using this sample here, I'll show you, you basically we're doing the same setup as we did at the top. I'm creating a new axis and I'm setting the spin axis and all the different initial properties for it. I create an evaluator for it and then I evaluate it just as I did in the first example here. Uh, this. Uh, for example, say I want to change the spin axis now, and so instead of spinning around the x-axis, I now want to spin around the y-axis instead. By doing that, if I take the same evaluator and evaluate it, I can uh, show that that particular rotation is not the same as the uh, rotation I just created. So I do have to get a new evaluator and evaluate it to show that um, it is now rotating around the y-axis. And so that's one thing you have to think about is make sure your definitional object is completely set up before you grab an evaluator for it. Or if you do need to change it, make sure you get a new evaluator uh, before you start evaluating it or your results won't be correct. So now that we know about evaluators, we need to understand about evaluator groups. Evaluator groups enable efficient evaluation of evaluators by eliminating redundant computations. So frequently inside components, an evaluator will use one or more evaluators to do its computation. And to avoid having each evaluation recalculate the same data, create an evaluator group and then pass it in when creating the evaluator. Uh, to use an evaluator group, first you want to uh, create an evaluator group 
and then pass in the group when creating the evaluator from your definitional object. Then optimize evaluators by updating their references. And finally, evaluate your evaluator. And at this point, they will share all redundant computations under the hood. I do want to note that creating and using evaluator groups is only helpful if the evaluation of all evaluators in the group is happening at the same evaluation times. If it's not, there really isn't an efficiency gain here. Uh, in the code sample, I'll show you how to create an evaluator group, obtain evaluators, optimize them, and evaluate them. So first I'll start by creating two points, point one and point two, using the methods down here below, get point and get other point. Uh, for the points, I just grab a uh, copy of the earth and I create a new point fixed offset in the inertial frame uh, for uh, that particular point. And then get other point is doing the same thing. Um, it's getting another point fixed offset in the inertial frame, just with a slightly different coordinates. And so once I have the two points, I will create my evaluator group, and then I'll create evaluators for each of those points by calling the observe cartographic point off of the instance of the Earth that I have. Uh, I will supply that group as a second uh, argument there in that method. And then what I want to do is optimize my uh, evaluators so that they both know, so the group knows that they're both there and they can share the redundant computations. So I call group.updateReference with my first evaluator and I use that as the new evaluator. This is what I'm going to evaluate is the updated reference for evaluator one. I do the same thing for evaluator two. And then as I go down and uh, I finally evaluate my cartographic one and my cartographic two using that updated reference, all the calculations that are uh, similar for each of these will be shared amongst them in the uh, evaluation process. Uh, so that's how you use an evaluator group. Delegates are something you might run across in components and so I want to talk about that pattern as well. Uh, a delegate is an abstract class with an abstract invoke method contained in that class and that, that abstract class can be derived from to create a callback method with a unique signature. Uh, that derived delegate method can then be passed to other methods that expect an invoke method. So delegates allow for custom behavior to be defined and passed into other classes, as we'll see in the code sample. Components delegates are defined as abstract classes instead of interfaces because we also use the hash code and equals methods. In the code sample, I'll show you a simple delegate example and then a more concrete example using the evaluator type. So first I'll show a simple example of how a delegate works. I'll start by creating a list of strings, uh, x, y, z, and a, and then what I want to do is use what uh, in components is a list helper function. There's a find index method and I want to look for the specific index a. And so this find index method takes my strings list and then also requires that I have a delegate that tells me whether or not I found that particular index that I'm looking for. So the predicate class here is a delegate type um, that we'll use to do that. And because it's a delegate type, I need to make sure I create an invoke method, which the delegate requires. And so I'll have an invoke method which returns a Boolean and if the object that is passed into me equals a, then I'll return true, otherwise I'll return false. So that predicate then will essentially tell me what my matching index is uh, using this find index method. If you decide to create your own evaluator, you'll need to follow our evaluator pattern when doing that. And because you are following this evaluator pattern, you're going to have to give your users a way to create an evaluator from their object. And so in the get evaluator method that you create, um, you'll have to uh, provide a delegate. And in this case, we're using one called get evaluator callback. Notice that down here, get evaluator callback is just declared as a private static final variable. And uh, I'll just get a new copy of that. And then looking at that particular method here, it invokes or it creates the invoke method to do whatever I need to do uh, in my particular evaluator to create that evaluator the user is going to use. 
So this is another example of using delegates in a custom evaluator uh, if you decide to create any of those for your own code. Services and SDK components are a flexible mechanism for accessing the capabilities of an object. Many parts of the components library use services to avoid being coupled to a particular class. Classes can implement the iService Provider interface if they want to support varying behaviors. In their getService method implementation, they'll return a reference to the class as being asked for or null if they don't support that particular service. We'll see how useful service providers can be when we look at the platform type and components shortly. For the service provider, uh, service provider code sample, I'll show how to create a service and then a service provider class, and then also how to access that service from an unrelated class. In this example, I actually want to start in the middle. I've got some interface that's going to provide an operation that I want to use for whatever business operations I'm, I'm working with. And so I create iSum service, it's an interface. And then I'm going to create a class that's going to implement that service. So I'm creating a class called my class that implements some service and it therefore has to implement the interface operation to do some operation. In my case, I'm just going to have it print out a line saying my operation was called. But my class also has to implement from iService provider if I want to make this service available to other users as well. So I'll implement iService provider and then I want to override the get service method that's in that particular interface. If the service type that they pass in, they're going to pass me a, a class. If that service type is of a class I support, so if it's equal to the iSum service class, then I can return uh, my current instance and the user will be able to call the do some operation method. If I don't support that class, I'm just going to return null. And note that uh, I could have an if in here for all kinds of different services that I might want to support in this get service method from my class. So now that my class is defined, let's go up and look at the main method. I'm going to create an instance of my class, and then I'm going to call do some operation if available, uh, adding my class instance as the argument there. So I'm inside do some operation if available. Notice that the argument type is I service provider and not my class. So it's important if you're going to implement services, if you're going to have some method, it's going to uh, expect services uh, to come into your method so that you can call them. Make sure you're using an I service provider type rather than a class type. And then you can just use a line like we have here on line 12. I can try and get my particular service out that I want to call I some service by calling the get service method with that class name. And if it returns null, I can go ahead and realize that that class provided to me doesn't implement that service. If it doesn't return null, that means it does support that service, and I can go ahead and call do some operation. So that's the essentials of service providers and how it separates the operational philosophy that I may want to use from a class implementation. Components is designed for multi-threading. Many of the operations it performs, such as propagating and computing access, are automatically performed in parallel using multiple threads. This enables the components to take full advantage of hyper-threaded and multi-core processors. You can control components' use of threads by using the methods in the threading policy class. Threading policy contains configuration information associated with each thread that controls the parallel operations of each thread. By default, the policy specifies that parallel operations create one thread per logical processor on the system. For example, if your system has four cores and each core is hyper-threaded, meaning that it supports two hardware threads, components will automatically create and utilize eight threads to compute access or coverage. Uh, you can use the isThreadSafe property to check for thread safety before performing multi-threaded operations. In the code sample, I'll show you uh, how to deal with types that are not thread safe, and then I'll show you how to control threading operations using the thread policy class. First, I'll show you how to check for thread safety. Uh, using the axes linear rate definitional object here again, uh, we'll set it up and get an evaluator for it. Uh, we've seen this in a previous example, so I won't go over that code. But once I have that evaluator, I'll create a second evaluator called a threaded evaluator. 
Um, if that evaluator is thread safe, I will go ahead and assign the threaded evaluator to my evaluator. But if it's not, I'm going to go ahead and need to make another copy of that evaluator and use that in threaded operation. So uh, using this code here, I can decide whether or not it's thread safe. That evaluator is thread safe. If it is, I can just assign it to my threaded evaluator and then uh, do something with my threaded evaluator in multiple threads further on in the code here. If it's not, I'll just need to make a copy of it and then I can go ahead and use it as well. Um, to run threaded calculations, let's look at the next example. If I want to set the number of threads in my uh, process uh, to something different than the default, which is all processors by default, I can use the threading policy set number of threads method. So I can just set that to an integer number of threads that it'll use, and that's what it'll use until you change it back. Uh, let's say I'm going to create a background calculation type, and this is a type that's included with components. I can create a background calculation and set up that calculation and then run that. Um, that background calculation uh, is spawning threads and working in the background. It's only going to be using five threads because we set the threading policy up here to only use five. If I come back later and say I want to configure to use all logical processors and run that process again, it'll use all the processors available. And so uh, changing the threading policy midstream and code like this is perfectly fine. You can do that uh, for whatever you need to do. Platforms are one of the main types used in components to model objects such as satellites, planes, and ground vehicles, and other real-world objects. Platforms have a location point and an orientation axis to specify the object's position and attitude over time. A point type in components represents a time-varying location, and the location point of a platform represents the platform's translational motion over the time span defined by that point object assigned to it. An axis type in components represents a time-varying orientation, and the orientation axis of a platform represents the platform's rotational motion over the time span defined by the axis object assigned to it. Um, the origin of the platform's axes is defined by a point object as well, and is often the platform's location point, though it doesn't have to be. Platforms have a collection of child platforms as well that can be used to accurately model your specific objects. Child platforms can have their location point be a specified fixed offset or moving offset from the parent's location point. Similar offsets and rotational geometry can be applied to the child's orientation as well. Platforms also have an extension collection. Extensions are classes that represent specific functionality that the platform will have. So, for example, you may have a platform that represents a satellite, and you'd like that satellite to have a camera on board. You could write an extension that performs the camera's functions and add it to the platform's extension collection to make that platform simulate your actual system. In the platform's code sample, I'll create a platform, then set its location and orientation, and I'll also show you how to extend the platform to become a sensor. Okay, so now I'll start with our platform example. Uh, first we'll show a create platform method, and then I'll show you the add platform extension method. So to create a platform, uh, you simply just create a new instance of the platform, and you can give it a name if you like. And then you want to go ahead and set the location point and orientation axes. And so to set the location point, this particular platform I'm just going to have be static in a single point on the ground. And so its location point will be a new point cartographic using this cartographic position here. Uh, remember, longitude is first, and then latitude and radians and the height. For the orientation, uh, the attitude of this platform, I'm just going to give it a uh, axis that represents the east-north-up frame. Uh, I'll give it an instance of the Earth's central body. And for the origin of that frame, I'm going to get the platform's location point. Uh, as I mentioned before, using the location point of the platform for the origin of the orientation is pretty common. So you'll see this particular pattern used quite a bit. Now I want to show you how to extend that platform to make it to actually do something. So I'm going to create that platform here. I'm going to call that my facility. And I'll just call the create platform method we just discussed. And I'll create another platform that I'm going to call sensor. 
and I'll set its location point to be a, fix, a point fixed offset from my facility's reference frame. So what I'm creating is a sensor from my facility on the ground that's offset from my uh, facility's reference frame by uh, zero meters in the east, 10 meters north, and 12.1 meters in the up direction or vertical direction. So that's going to be my offset for my sensor. And then uh, my sensor orientation will be an axis east north up of its own, and I'll use its own location point for the center of that orientation uh, as well. And now to actually make it do something, I'm going to create a complex conic, which is a geometric shape available in components, and that'll be my sensor shape. Uh, you can manipulate that complex conic as well and um, have all kinds of different sensor shapes that are available in components. And then I'll take that sensor shape, that complex conic, and give it uh, as an argument to a field of view extension. So we have several different extension types, and the field of view is one. This will create a field of view that's based on the geometry of that sensor shape. Once I create that field of view extension, I can just add that to the extensions collection of my sensor. And now my facility that has a separate offset sensor will have a complex sensor shape that's used for its field of view. And I can then use that in access calculations or analysis or whatever I need to do with it. That's all there is for that example. Before I finish the course, I do want to show you a little about performing analysis using access queries and components. In SDK, SDK components, and in fact all of AGI's tools, the term access means when objects can see other objects based on their position and orientation and varying constraints. In SDK components, access is determined by evaluating access queries at a single time or over a time interval. To create an access query, you can use one or any logical combination of many different access constraints. Also, access constraints can be created for single objects or for links between objects. So, for example, you may want to create a ground antenna site and a satellite in low Earth orbit. You can't communicate with your satellite when it's over the horizon and because of poor atmospheric conditions uh, cause too many errors maybe in your data stream, you can only receive data from your satellite when it's 15 degrees above the horizon. In this case, you'll need to model the central body obstruction constraint and the elevation angle constraint. These two constraints will then be logically anded together, and then evaluating access on the combined constraint will give you access times when both of those conditions are met. You can use any logical combination of ands, ors, or nots to define your access conditions, um, and you may want to check out the programmer's guide for more examples of different access queries that you can use. In the Access Query code sample, I'll show how to create access constraints and then evaluate them to receive access times based on that combined constraint. So the first thing I want to show you is that uh, to create an access query, I first want to create a couple of different platforms to represent the satellite and ground facility situation I just explained. So in, I'll create a platform called satellite using the create satellite method below and then I'll create a facility using the create facility method below. So let's go look at those. To create a satellite, as always, I'll get a copy of the Earth. We always need that. I'll create a platform called the ISS, or the International Space Station. So we're going to use the ISS as our satellite. I'll set its name, and then I'll create something called a two-line element set, or TLE. If you're not familiar with TLEs, uh, TLEs are a way to represent a satellite's orbit in space using a small set of data. And this is exactly what a TLE looks like here. This is a two-line element set for the International Space Station. So this data is going to, going to allow me to model the orbit of the satellite. Uh, I'll set the ISS location point by creating a new SGP4 propagator. This is the type of propagator that we need to use for TLEs. And by propagating that information out, I can uh, create, um, I can determine where the satellite's going to be in its orbit. And I need to get a point, remember, to set that location point. And so on this SGP4 propagator, there is a create point method that I can use for that location point. That will give me the location of the ISS at any given time. Uh, next, I'll set the orientation axes. 
and I'm going to use an axis type called axis vehicle velocity local horizontal or VVLH as we usually call it. I will um, put that orientation in the uh, fixed frame and I will use the center of that reference axis to be the ISS location point uh, as per usual. To create the facility, um, I'll create a platform called Facility and name it AGI Headquarters. I'll set the location point to be a port point cartographic, which we've seen before. And again, here I'm using a longitude, latitude, altitude for that cartographic. And I'll set the orientation axes to be an axis east, north, up that we've seen before. So now that I have my satellite and I have my facility, uh, let's return to our method up here where we've created those and start looking at how to create the access query. So because I'm looking at access between a satellite and a facility, between two objects, I'm actually looking for a link. I need to be able to, to define a link between the two objects and get access on that link. Uh, there are two types of links in components. Uh, we're going to use link instantaneous, which does not take the speed of light into account between the satellite as the receiver and the facility as the transmitter. Uh, actually, that might be reversed. It might be facility as the receiver there. Um, so the other type of link is link speed of light. If you do care about speed of light calculations, you'll want to use the link speed of light type instead of link instantaneous. So this just creates a link between these two objects. I'll get Earth again. And now I'm going to create a central body obstruction constraint. So all I really need to do is define that link in that uh, central body, Earth. So that link, if you imagine a line between these two objects, that link will be broken by a central body if there's a central body in the way. And so that's really all the central body obstruction constraint needs is to know what that link is since both of those objects move as a function of time. The next constraint I want to set up is the elevation angle constraint. I will specify the link for that and I'll specify which uh, link role in that link is actually going to be the one we apply the constraint to. And it should be the receiver, which is the facility in this case. I'll also supply the central body and I can supply the minimum elevation angle in this constructor as well. And so I want the minimum elevation angle to be 15 degrees. Uh, so what I've got now are two different constraints, the central body constraint and the elevation angle constraint. I want to make sure I can use both of those together. So I want both of those to be satisfied at the same time. And so I'll use a, a type called access query and that ands both of these together. I can have multiple items uh, in this constructor if I need to add more queries, for example. Uh, but in my case, I'm only going to need to and the two together. So that creates my access query that I'll return and evaluate. Let's go see how we can evaluate that. So in the access constraint evaluation method, I will get the access constraint here that we just talked about. I'll get an evaluator on that access query and I'll evaluate it just like we've evaluated other evaluators before. I'll get a start date and a stop date. So I want to start on January 1st, 2009. I want to evaluate over one day, so my stop date now is going to be one day later than my start date. I'll get an item called my access query result that is the result of evaluating from start date to stop date. Uh, once I have my result, um, that's going to be something called the satisfaction intervals that I need. So I'll get the satisfied intervals. These are the um, intervals, the time intervals over which I do have access and that's returned as a time interval collection. And so what I'll do then is I'll print out the total number of accesses that I have. I will get the first access start time and I will get the first access duration. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that and see what our results are. So it turns out that between AGI HQ and the International Space Station uh, on January 1st, 2009, I had three axes I'm sorry, three accesses that um, met the constraints of uh, the central body constraint and an elevation angle above 15 degrees uh, for that day. The first axis started uh, at 0514 Zulu, and that's UTC time. Uh, and the first axis duration was 280 seconds long. Well, that's the end of the introduction to SDK components for Java. 
I do want to remind you that the Programmer's Guide is the place to turn for information on components and how to use them. I've covered the basics of programming with components and introduced you to some patterns you'll need to know. I haven't touched on much analysis in this introduction though. See the examples online to learn more about what each component library does and for more information uh, about in-depth analysis. I've also listed here some important search terms if you need them and also our support number and email. Don't forget to check out the forms in the resources section as well. Thanks for watching.